And the angel said, follow me. And in verse 9, Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing. He had no idea. At this point, he simply thought that he was dreaming, saw a vision. And it's quite interesting because I actually did have a very significant dream or vision when I was in prison because after I'd only been in for four months and just after my trial, I actually had a clear vision of the day that I would be released. And I saw myself out of the prison preaching in the largest auditorium in London. So I fully understand here, Peter doesn't understand what's happening, can't realize that it's actually true, and what he's doing is he thinks it's simply a vision or a dream. But in verse 10, they passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. So they'd passed all the other guards, nobody at the moment seeing him. And the iron gate leading to the city opened by itself. And when they walked through it and walked the length of simply one street, the angel left him. And then suddenly, in verse 11, Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. So you you can understand, suddenly it's only when he's actually walking down the street that he realizes what had happened. So by the time you get to verse 12, when this dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, and it appears that um, it's John whose brother James had been killed by Herod. And um, when he... That a lot of people, it seems that most of the church were gathered in the house and were praying, having a powerful prayer meeting, praying for Peter. And Peter, I love this, I love this story. In verse 13, Peter knocked on the outer entrance, the door, and the servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed. (laughs) Yes, but she was so shocked. I wouldn't just use the word overjoyed here. I would say, yes, she was excited, but she was so shocked. She ran back without opening the door. (laughs) I, I can just, here's Peter banging on the door. The girl seen him, recognized who it is, and is so excited and shocked that she doesn't even open the door. It's almost as if she's seeing an apparition or a dream. And she goes back and uh, said, it's Peter. And in verse 15, the response of those in prayer, and again, I like this, response of these people in prayer is, you're out of your mind. You're dreaming. You're seeing things. How can Peter be at the door? We know he's in prison and we're praying for him to get out. (laughs) And when she kept insisting, verse 15, when, when she kept insisting that it was Peter, They said it must be his angel. (laughs) They still, you know, (laughs) it it shocks me that um, here are people praying specifically and when the answer is at the door, they can't even believe and accept it. You know, sometimes I think that's a danger with uh, people praying in in the church. Do they really expect to get their answer. I sometimes think with Christians, if God actually physically answered what they asked for, they would be so shocked because so often there is no real expectation that God can do it. And, you know, 
I find much of praying is not praying factually in faith for something to happen, but just wishy-washy, oh, I can't stand that sort of praying. If I'm praying, I'm very strong and determined I know what I want. Anyway, so the the church praying inside is convinced Peter isn't there, it's only an angel. But in verse 16, Peter kept on knocking and banging and making so much noise. And when they opened the door and they saw him, they were astonished. You know, astonished because God had answered their prayer. And uh, Peter, it says in verse 17, motioned with his hand for them to be quiet. And then he described how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he simply then said, um, uh, James tell James and the brothers about this, and he left for another place. <laughs> he didn't stay long with them <laughs> because there, there, there was no faith here. He left. And in verse 18 in the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had happened because when they woke up, I mean, they were asleep in the middle of the night when they woke up. They, in verse 19, Herod made a thorough search for him, couldn't find him, and he cross-examined the guards and had them put to death. So <laughs> the poor guards uh, are themselves executed because how did Peter get out? And they, had no, they, they got no answer. They didn't know they were asleep. They didn't see what happened. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> knowing my own release from prison, I understand the shock of what was happening. So it then says in verse 15, Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there a while. And this, this is a little bit unusual here because it says in verse 20, he'd been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And um, they sought an audience with him to try and resolve the problem. And having secured the support of uh, uh, someone who's a personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for the food supply. So when you come to verse 21, on the appointed day, Herod, wearing his clothes, royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. And in verse 20, they shouted, this is the voice of a God, not a man. 23, immediately, because Herod didn't give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down. He was eaten by warm worms and died. But the word of God continued to increase and spread.